Hello and welcome to this Red Gaming Tech video, myself and Marta, where of course I'm here as always with a collection of the latest tech news from the last 24 or so hours. So what do I have for you today my friends? Well I'm actually going to kick things off today with something from Spectre and Meltdown. And before you clutch your forehead like, oh no, oh god, there's another variant. No, 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 that's not the case here. What I actually have here is some MIT researchers who have found a new way to actually fight back against the Spectre and Meltdown vulnerabilities. Now, of course, there have been numerous updates and fixes to these particular security vulnerabilities, but what we have here is a new way to partition and isolate memory caches with protection domains. This new technology, which is called Dynamically Allocated Wayguard, or DOG, this allows hits across protection domains, and this is very important because an attacker will target this vulnerability or targeting this vulnerability, should I say, takes advantage of cache timing attacks and can get access to private data. So while this is by no means a silver bullet against all known variants of Spectre and Meltdown, it does look rather promising. And on the PDF, which of course will be linked in the description below this video, the MIT researcher's paper assures us that it, it will require, quote, minimal modifications to the underlying operating system, and they also assure that the performance overhead is, quote, unquote, reasonable. Now, of course, that is a subject that is quite important because on numerous of these Spectre and Meltdown updates, we have seen a, to be honest, unacceptable level of impact on the performance with some of them. And to be assured it's reasonable, well, what does reasonable mean is obviously the question, what's reasonable to you is not reasonable to me, all that sort of thing. I would obviously want to see the actual numbers there, but it does look promising. Now, I do actually have a direct quote here from one of the researchers, which reads, quote, These attacks fundamentally changed our understanding of what's trustworthy in a system and forced us to re-examine where we devote security resources. They've shown that we need to be paying much more attention to the micro-architecture of systems. However, regarding the actually new technology itself, they said, or the lead author said, who's Vladimir Korinsky, said, quote, We think this is an important step forward in giving computer architects, cloud providers, and other IT professionals a better way to efficiently and dynamically allocate resources. It establishes clear boundaries where sharing should and should not happen, so that programs with sensitive information can keep that data reasonably secure. Now, as I said, it is not yet to the point where it can protect us against the full sort of spectrum of currently known attacks and vulnerabilities but they are fairly confident that with more work and research they can get the technology to that point but for the moment it is sort of protecting against the main ones but obviously new variants have popped up all that sort of thing and obviously there might be still undiscovered ones it would not actually surprise me so as I said, there's going to be a PDF linked in the description below this video for those of you who want to give it a read. Perhaps you're interested in the nitty gritty of how this actually works. But we're going to move on to a new topic from Intel. Now, this is just a small thing, but it's definitely an important thing, I think, for the future of the company, as especially since we're not going to be seeing 10 nm until 2019. And of course, we still don't have a replacement for their CEO who left the company back in June of this year. So what we actually have here is that they are planning to split its manufacturing group into three segments. Now we don't yet know how these three groups are actually going to work together, but the decision to split the manufacturing division is important and obviously it's going to help clarify things and obviously how they're actually going to work together, nitty gritty of all of that is going to be important. But what we actually have here is the technology department, which is going to be led by the CTO, Mike Mayberry, the manufacturing and operations led by Anne Kelleher, and the supply chain, which is going to be led by Randir Takur. So hopefully with this sort of split manufacturing process, we can see things become smoother in the future. You know, perhaps some internal manufacturing issues and way the company has actually been run when it comes to how they're actually going about it are some, at least contributing factors to the 10 m delay. I'm not saying that's the sole, the sole reason, should I say, but I would assume that if they're making this decision, it's definitely played a part because they're not just going to do this for funsies, are they? Anyway. Speaking of NM, we actually got something from Samsung. So what we actually have here is that Samsung have commenced the mass production of its 7NM LPP EUV process, which just rolls right off the tongue, as I'm sure you can appreciate. So what we actually have here is it's going to be making use of an extreme ultraviolet lithography, or again, EUVL, for certain layers. So what does that actually mean? Well, they're actually going to obtain a 40% area reduction at the same complexity 
and also a 50% lower power consumption at the same frequency, but most importantly, a 20% performance boost using the same power and complexities. And the reason I brought up the EUVL for select layers thing, it wasn't just for funsies, it was to point out that this actually enables Samsung to place 40% more transistors inside its next-gen SoCs, while also re reducing that all-important power consumption. So given that these are going to be for smartphones, that is very, very important. Battery technology when it comes to smartphones obviously hasn't really, really moved or done anything interesting or improved all that much. So it is unfortunately down to the other sort of parts of the smartphone to kind of reduce the amount of demand that they have on the battery to increase that battery life or how efficiently it actually makes use of the power that you do indeed have. And I will say that if you're interested in reading more about the EUV based 7nm LPP process, there is a rather lengthy article by Samsung on the Samsung newsroom. It is going to be linked in the description below this video, so go give it a read if you're at all interested in the nitty gritty of how this is actually going to work, and if you're interested in how it's actually going to play a part in the future of smartphones, I would highly recommend you give it a read. I have very much given you the cliff notes. So what we actually have for our next topic is something regarding VR, which actually could make it more accessible. And this is something by the name of Motion Smoothing, as we have developers at Steam VR making a rather interesting announcement about this feature that apparently is going to enable, quote, more players on more PCs to play high fidelity VR games and experiences. So Motion Smoothing does pretty much what you suspect it does. It interpolates between two existing frames and creates a new in-between frame that smooths the experience. So SteamVR detects when an application is about to drop frames, and according to the Steam post, which of course will be linked in the description below this video, it quote, looks at the last two delivered frames, estimates motion and animation, and extrapolates a new frame. Synthesizing new frames keeps the current application at full frame rate, advantage motion forward, and avoids judder. So basically you can enjoy full frame rate, but the performance requirements actually decrease. So again, this will in theory makes VR less, I'm sorry, more accessible. It's obviously one of the issues of virtual reality on PC is obviously not only is the headset itself very expensive, the hardware required to run it at a reasonable frame rate to avoid that motion sickness issue is obviously in itself very expensive as well. Basically, with this new feature, according to the Steam post again, lower end GPUs will actually be able to get a nice VR experience, which was only previously available on the very tippy top of the top end. Now, at the moment, it is only available in the beta program of Steam VR and does require a NVIDIA GPU. Now, unfortunately, this is only for the HTC Vive because, quotes, their underlying display drivers use different techniques when applications miss frame rates. So, at least for now, this is just for the Vive. Hopefully, we'll see a similar technology implemented on the Oculus Rift, but for the moment, this is a Vive-only thing, but it's still promising if we could get the requirements down for VR in terms of not only you know, optimization of future hardware and all that sort of thing, but obviously with software implementations like this, then obviously we can make it more accessible, which I think will definitely help it become more mainstream. So to finish things off today, I actually have something from Apple. So what you have here is something spotted by 9 to 5 mac as the Apple analyst Ming-Chi Ko has suggested that Apple's A-series processors could be coming to Macs sooner rather than later. And he even states that we could be seeing Macs with Apple chips by 2020, and we could see an, an autonomous Apple car system running by 2023. Now his comments do actually line up with a earlier report this year from Bloomberg, but he does basically state that we're going to be seeing the first Mac with a custom ARM based chip in either 2020 or 2021. Now obviously this does have both pros and cons for Apple, obviously they could make more profit from this, but an ARM based chip is unlikely to take on the high end Intel offerings, but obviously it does kind of free Apple at the same time from the constraints of Intel's own roadmap, which obviously has had a few delays lately as we've discussed many times. So it definitely has, again, pros and cons to bring to the table, but obviously Apple are trying to at least begin the process of moving away 
from their reliance on Intel by having their own ARM-based chips. Obviously, again, you're not going to see them beating the ones you find a high-end MacBook Pro or desktop, for instance. So I think we're probably going to see this on the low end for now. But it obviously could improve for the future, that sort of thing. But I would fully expect this to not be a complete rollout. Like, yep, you're never going to see an Intel processor in an Apple Mac again. That's a bit silly. But we are, I think, going to see more and more ARM chips in Apple Macs and all that sort of thing in the future as we go forward. And maybe just leave the Intel stuff for the higher end, or maybe not at all. We'll have to wait and see what Apple actually have in store for us. Anyway, that is me done for this video. Thank you very much for watching. As always, your support is highly appreciated, and I'll see you next time.